Magandang araw mga kasama. Tayo ay muling Chumika sa Chikahan with Tito Jo. Before we start, don't forget to like and share this video. Also to follow our Facebook page, Anak Bayan Europa. This episode, ang ating Chikahan ay ang Peace Under the Fascist Duterte Regime where we would know more about the NDFP and GRP peace negotiations. Uh, Tito, ready ka na ba for our Chikahan? <laughs> Oo, ready na. Ayan, Tito. So, um, Tito, our first question would be sa ating Chikahan, no? For the sake of our viewers, can you explain what the peace talks are? Or what? Uh, why are there peace negotiations between the GRP and the NDFP? Is it possible to hold the peace negotiations in the Philippines? Or are there any countries that have the same negotiations? There is an armed conflict in the Philippines, a civil war between the People's Democratic Government, which is represented by the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, NDFP, and the Philippine Reactionary Government, GRP, a big a government of big compradors, landlords, and corrupt bureaucrats. It was during the Aquino regime in 1989, and then the Ramos regime in 1992, that the GRP approached the NDFP in the Netherlands for peace negotiations. It was in 1992 that the GRP and NDFP signed the Hague Joint Declaration as the framework for the peace negotiations. They agreed that the peace negotiations must address the roots of the armed conflict and forge comprehensive agreements on social, economic, and political reforms in order to lay the basis for a just and lasting peace. The substantive agenda for the peace negotiations has uh, four items. Uh, one, respect for human rights and international humanitarian law. Two, social and economic reforms. Three, political and constitutional reforms. And four, end of hostilities and disposition of forces. The GRP and NDFP also agreed to hold the peace negotiations in a neutral foreign venue until all the comprehensive agreements have been signed in order to prevent peace saboteurs from harming the NDFP negotiators um, <coughs> and um, other personnel uh, the con uh, who include the consultants and staff and resource persons. Um, and to prevent the, these same uh, peace saboteurs from uh, uh, sabotaging the entire uh, peace process. The NDFP personnel had a bad experience of being surveilled during the 1986 ceasefire negotiations between the GRP and NDFP. And then when the ceasefire agreement broke down, they were subjected to abductions and killings by the GRP military and intelligence agencies. So it was agreed that uh, it was unhealthy, unwise uh, for the NDFP to negotiate in the Philippines. In the long history of mankind and in recent history, there have been many cases of peace negotiations between two warring parties that belong to one country, but who agree to negotiate peace in a neutral venue abroad in order to preempt sabotage by elements who oppose the peace negotiations. Examples of such peace negotiations are too, uh, uh, too many to mention. Uh, oh, okay. I can mention some recent uh, examples like uh, yes. uh, the uh, uh, warring parties in Colombia meeting and negotiating in Havana. Or if we uh, uh, mention a significant uh, negotiations in a third country uh, in the past. Uh, you know, the negotiations about uh, the settlement of the war in uh, Vietnam uh, were done in Paris. No? All right, Tito, uh, next question for Chikahan. What are the JASIG or J A S I G and CASER, C A S E R, and why are they important or relevant? The JASIC is the acronym of the Joint Agreement on Safety and Immunity Guarantees for the benefit and protection of the negotiators, consultants, advisors, resource persons, and staff personnel of the negotiating panels uh, of both the GRP and NDRP. Uh, the JASIG 
carries the provision that peace negotiations must be held in a neutral venue abroad by way of guaranteeing the safety of the negotiating panels and all related persons. CASER is the acronym for Comprehensive uh, Agreement on Social and Economic Reforms. This is supposed to be the second item in the substantive agenda in the peace negotiations. Its main content is agrarian reform and national industrialization and is supposed to be the meat or main substance uh, for a just peace. The first item is the comprehensive uh, agreement on respect for human rights and international humanitarian law. This is also important, no? This was uh, uh, finished and approved by the GRP and NDRP uh, principles in 1998. It's supposed to uh, uh, make sure that, to, uh, uh, that the two sides respect uh, the Geneva Conventions and all the uh, human rights conventions. And this uh, uh, is useful in uh, setting up the Joint Monitoring Committee, uh, which uh, uh, receive uh, complaints of uh, violations from uh, both sides. And um, uh, it's also, uh, the, this Joint Committee is also in charge of monitoring uh, uh, ceasefire agreements when they are uh, made from time to time. All right, Tito. Um, how do the negotiations work? The GRP and NDFP negotiating panels negotiate all the important issues and the comprehensive agreements as well as other important agreements to be made. With regard to the drafting and negotiation of the comprehensive uh, uh, agreements, the said panels have their respective uh, uh, working committees on each item of the substantive agenda. The meetings of the panels and their respective working committees are arranged by the third party facilitator, the Royal Norwegian government, represented by the special envoy to the Philippine pro peace process. All right. The, uh, the fourth question would be, neo-Marxists and some Western Marxists are critical of peace negotiations. Some even say that the CPP is turning into revisionists because of this. But why are peace talks crucial in ending the poverty and armed conflict in the Philippines? Those you mention as neo-Marxists and Western Marxists who are critical of peace negotiations as revisionists are pseudo-Marxists and are completely ignorant of the history of revolutionary wars and peace negotiations. The Chinese Communist Party negotiated and made truce with the Kuomintang several times in order to fight the northern warlords and then the Japanese aggressors. Mao Zedong went to the Chongqing peace negotiations uh, with the, the Kuomintang in an attempt to uh, forestall civil war. Um, and as a result uh, of the peace negotiations, uh, uh, Mao uh, wrote a lot of articles teaching us uh, a lot uh, about how to negotiate in favor of the people. The NDRP has also learned a lot from the negotiating principles and methods of the Vietnamese revolutionaries in negotiations with U.S. imperialists in Paris. Peace negotiations are a way of broadcasting to the Filipino people and the people of the world the NDFP program of People's Democratic Revolution. It is a way of showing that the revolutionary movement has gained so much strength that the enemy is suing for peace. It is a way of testing, proving, and exposing how the enemy is incapable of meeting the demands of the people. It is a way of preventing the enemy from claiming unilaterally that it is the champion of peace while misrepresenting the revolutionary forces of the people as warmongers. Despite the long series of peace talks, the revolutionary movement led by the Communist Party of the Philippines has never capitulated nor stopped from waging the People's Democratic Revolution through protracted people's war. It has succeeded in exposing the reactionary character of one GRP regime after another. There is no naive or revisionist illusion that peace talks are the way to end poverty um, 
and armed conflict in the Philippines. And may I know of where these pseudo-Marxist blabbers are waging a people's war uh, to prove uh, that they know what they are talking about. Of course, that's a rhetorical question. Huh? <laughs> or is Tito. Yeah, that's true. Actually, not, not, uh, we proceed to the next question, Tito. The uh, Communist Party of the Philippines and the left were both when Duterte comes to power, especially with him advertising his relation to the left and his openness to peace negotiation. Now that Duterte is showing his true color, how do the Communist Party of the Philippines and peace-loving citizens see the negotiations with Duterte? There is absolutely no more possibility of NDFP negotiating uh, with uh, the GRP while Duterte is the president. Before he could finish his first year as president, he was clearly manifesting his lack of interest in peace negotiations. The NDRP was not at all surprised when he terminated the peace negotiations on November 23, 2017, and designated as terrorists the CPP and NPA on December 5, 2017. Subsequently, he created the National Task Force, uh, supposedly to eliminate <coughs> communist armed conflict. No? Recently, he signed the law by which he gave himself and a council of fellow butchers the license to use state terrorism in order to obtain charter chains and fascist dictatorship. If the CPP and NDRP outrightly rejected and did not test Duterte's plea or offer of peace negotiations, in the first year of his rule, the same pseudo-Marxists and Trotskyites would have claimed that the CPP and NDAP were dogmatists and were plain lovers of war. The fact is that the CPP and NDAP kept on scolding Duterte for failing to amnesty and release the political prisoners, rebuffed every attempt of Duterte to trick or put one over the revolutionary movement, and never stopped the people's war, except for short periods of ceasefire for humanitarian reasons and purposes of goodwill. The CPP and NPA never gave up the people's war just because the NDFP engaged the GRP in peace negotiations. Tito, uh, in a span of two years, I know, we lost uh, three great warriors for peace and patriots, Karangi Malayao, Kafidel Agkawili, and Karen Alatani. So these three deserve great contribution. Can you introduce them briefly to our viewers? Kafidel Agkawili was the chairman of the NDFP negotiating panel at the time of his death on July 23. He was a long-time proletarian revolutionary since the 1960s. Uh, he and I developed together ideologically, politically, and organizationally. He made significant contributions to the revolutionary movement. He died from the rupture of his pulmonary artery. I invite the listeners to read my long tribute to him and the tributes of other comrades who knew and loved him. Karandi Malayo was murdered by state forces in January 2019. He was a consultant of the NDFP negotiating panel. He was the press officer and spokesperson of the NDFP panel in the peace negotiations. He was an outstanding leader from his student days, a UP campus writer and officer of the College Editors Guild of the Philippines. He was active in the National Democratic Movement as an advocate of a just peace for decades. He was shot to death by Duterte's undercover agents while he was sleep asleep in a bus at a bus stop in Arita, Nueva Vizcaya. Garandi had no criminal charges against him before any government court and was campaigning for peace around the country. I invite the listeners to read my tribute to him. A book on peace is published uh, recently in his honor. Carl Randall, Randall Echanis was a senior consultant of the NDFP negotiating panel, member of the Reciprocal Working Committee on Social and Economic Reforms, and head of its subcommittee on agrarian reform and rural development. He was chairman of the Anakpawis party list and deputy general secretary of the Kilusang, of the Kilusang Magbubukin ng Pilipinas. He was murdered recently in his own apartment by a death squad of the Duterte regime. 
Tito Duterte ordered the killings and the rest of the NDFP consultant and activists. In fact, there are more political prisoners under his regime. How are these affecting the negotiations, especially with the recent killing of Carandal? In the first place, the Duterte regime terminated the peace negotiations in 2017. Since then, um, they had, the regime has been arresting and killing NDFP consultants and other people tagged as communists. The murders of Karandi Malayao and Karandal Echanis have made peace negotiations more impossible than ever before while Duterte is in power. Tito, um, there are a lot of peace saboteurs in the ranks of AFP and PNP. Uh, why do you think uh, there are saboteurs and why are, what are they doing to sabotage the box? The president and negotiating panel of the GRP always involved the so-called national security cluster of the cabinet and peace negotiations because these are about the armed conflict. Thus, retired and active military and police officers who are extremely pro-U.S., anti-communist, and reactionary have a say on the peace negotiations of the GRP. Several times they sabotage the peace negotiations by pushing demands that amount to making the revolutionary movement paralyze itself or surrender to the reactionary government, like protracted and indefinite ceasefire or repeated ceasefires, and then making false accusations of ceasefire violations in order to stop the negotiations on substantive issues. They themselves violate the JASIG or many other terms of the peace negotiations very often by arresting or killing people involved in the peace negotiations on the side of the NDRP. They are not interested in addressing the roots of the armed conflict. They think that the, that the military solution is the sole or best solution to the basic problems of the people. It is, also, it is also convenient for the president of the GRP to refer to the advice of the national security cluster when he or she decides to stop or delay the peace negotiations for pressure purposes or for, that, for whatever other reason. They would suddenly make unreasonable demands which violate the unreasonable, they, <coughs> they would suddenly make unreasonable demands which violate the terms of the peace negotiations. Duterte decided to terminate the peace negotiations in 2017 for the purpose of scapegoating the CPP and NPA and then justifying state terrorism and pushing his scheme of fascist dictatorship through charter chains. He also pledged to Trump in 2017 to eliminate the revolutionary movement. Tito, why do you think that Duterte's regime keeps on resorting to brutality, violence, and more murder? Why does he keep on ordering the arrest, killings, and imprisonment of the activists and peace advocates? Does this show that his strength and that the activists and dissent should now cower in fear? Duterte is certified as a psychopath by psychiatrists, and uh, he himself a boast of having murdered people like killing a fellow teenager or showing to his police officers how to kill captives efficiently and with impunity while he was double city mayor. Several times he has publicly <coughs> and shamelessly directed the police and military to frame up, uh, arrest, and kill suspects with impunity. His uh, first acts in power were to order the release, the listing, the listing and killing of drug suspects by the thousands, up to more than 30,000 in only two years' time. Secretly, he ordered an all-out war against the revolutionary movement under the cover of the military officers merely continuing the Oplan Bayanihan of Aquino. Now he is in, his, in a frenzy to arrest and kill people under his law of state terrorism. Duterte never had any idea or program of developing the Philippine economy outside of the neoliberal frame. His frame of mind is to rule like a bully mayor who is mostly or solely concerned with peace and order and killing street criminals and political opponents. 
His main or sole program is kill, 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 and intimidate people in order to subjugate or silence them. He has engaged in the mass murder of drug suspects to make himself the supreme drug lord and to make his own crime family dominant. And he now attacks the revolutionary movement and orders the arrest, killings, and imprisonment of the activists and peace advocates in connection with his scheme to impose a full-blown fascist dictatorship on the people. The tyrant's brutality is not only due to a sick mind, but due to a desire for absolute power and absolute corruption. But due to his brutality, abuse of power, and corruption, Duterte has already bankrupted the Philippine economy and his own government. He has channeled extremely large amounts of public funds to corruption and to excessive funding of the military and police at the expense of economic development and social services. He has allowed the smuggling in of illegal drugs and other goods to the Philippines, as well as the smuggling out of mineral ores of precious metals to China. So Duterte has rendered his own regime extremely isolated and weak politically and financially. He is extremely weak now despite his constant efforts to show off as a bully and butcher. The Duterte regime is notorious for being traitorous in being a puppet to two imperialist powers and of course for being tyrannical, murderous, corrupt, and mendacious. Ito, the armed revolution in the Philippines has been going on for 50 years. Some say it has been going on for five decades because it is failing um, the left. But why does the CPP say that the 50 years is a success? Can you explain that? The CPP started with only some educators and members uh, with an organized mass following of only 20,000 in 1968 and then gaining another 80,000 by joining up with elements of the old revolutionary movement in Tarlac. Now the CPP has tens of thousands of members. The New People's Army, with thousands of red fighters, aside from the bigger numbers of, uh, of um, <coughs> local people's militia and self-defense units, revolutionary uh, mass organizations with millions of members and organs of political power in charge of many more millions of people nationwide in more than 110 guerrilla fronts in 74 out of the 81 Philippine provinces. It is not a meager achievement to have all the aforementioned. There has never been a bigger and stronger revolutionary movement in Philippine history. There are now two governments in the Philippines the People's Democratic Government, uh, which is the sum total of the local organs of political power, uh, it is now engaged in a civil war with the other government, the reactionary government of big compradors, landlords, and corrupt officials. A puppet government that gets huge military assistance <clears throat> from U.S. imperialism. If not the most outstanding, the Philippine revolutionary is now one of the most outstanding armed revolutionary movements in the Philippines. And it is in the forefront in the world, it is in the front form of the rising anti-imperialist and democratic struggles and the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. Ito, will we ever find peace under this regime or will we actually achieve peace? The Duterte regime has terminated the peace negotiations since 2017 and is now in a frenzy to impose state terrorism on the Filipino people and realize the scheme of fascist dictatorship. The, the regime is not for any peace negotiations or any just peace agreement. To win the just peace, the Filipino people have no choice but to wage a revolutionary struggle against the traitorous, tyrannical, genocidal, and plundering Duterte regime, and against the rotten ruling system. So how can us, the youth, carry forward the advocacies of Cafetel, Carandi, and Carandal? 
Capidel, Carandi, and Carandal wanted a just peace like the Filipino people. Under the current circumstances, the desire for a just peace can be realized only by ousting the Duterte regime, getting rid of the tyranny that is now subjecting the people to escalating conditions of oppression and exploitation and being, and being prepared for any eventuality while the rotten semi-colonial and semi-feudal uh, ruling system persists. Uh, you know, uh, the quick way uh, to have the opportunity to resume the peace negotiations is uh, for Duterte to be ousted, replaced by his constitutional uh, yeah. successor. But that can happen only if uh, there, there are gigantic mass actions and this would encourage <clears throat> the uh, anti-Duterte forces uh, within the bureaucracy and especially within the military. So um, uh, Duterte can be ousted from power the, the same way that Marcos was ousted. But even then, uh, the revolutionary movement has to be alert and prepared just in case uh, something new develops like uh, Duterte is uh, able to stretch his role or because of his uh, uh, because of extreme use uh, of uh, uh, violence or he can put in his successor or a military junta can take over but if uh, let us say uh, the constitutional succession is accomplished, then there is a chance uh, for uh, uh, peace negotiations to be resumed. Mm -hmm. But while Duterte is in power, there is no more chance uh, for peace negotiations. I see, Tito. Um, again, I think that ends our chikahan for this episode. Thank you so much, Tito, for being with us. And it is always a pleasure for having this chikahan with you. Um, anyway, we have a message to our audience and to our viewers. I am pleased uh, that uh, we have uh, a Chikahan on current issues. And, uh, um, of course, uh, we can always have uh, uh, discussions on the burning issues uh, because these are the issues that must be attended to. Uh, they uh, uh, are outcomes of... Uh, the basic problems of the Filipino people and uh, uh, the people uh, need to understand the issues uh, so that they may be able to undertake uh, the, the actions that must be undertaken uh, in order to uh, fight for their rights and interests against, uh, uh, against uh, uh, adversity, especially the, this uh, unjust and tyrannical regime that now exists in the Philippines. Ayan, Tito, thank you so much again. Uh, to our audience, kayo ay muli nakisika sa amin Tito Jo, Tito sa Chikahan with Tito Jo and ang ating sinika today ay ang peace under fascist um, under fascist Duterte's regime. So if you have learned more and you want more of this Chikahan, don't forget to like a share and follow our page Anakbayan Europa for more chicka hands with Tito Jo. Again, ako po pala si Kasama Price, Kasama si Tito Jo. Papagpalayang gabi po para sa ating lahat.